my name is Kristen with the New Prague Area Historical Society. We want to thank you all so much for coming out to hear our presentation today, The History of Quilting with Sue Tuma. A uh, couple things I wanted to let you know. You'll notice on the tables, there's some postcards on the tables. You, uh, you guys are welcome to take those home tonight. Um, if you'd like to send one to family or friends this Christmas season, you're welcome to do that. There's also a few um, items up on the table there. If you'd like some um, reading on the history of New Prague, you're welcome to stop there too. Um, the pieces of the paper and the um, pens and pencils on the table. Um, when you leave tonight, if you wanna give us any feedback on our uh, presentation, the sound system, and also uh, mention your favorite way of, letting, of finding out about our events. Some people like finding out through Facebook or email, or you might have seen it on the bank signs or even just flyers around town. That helps us know where to focus our time and energy when we have our events so that we can reach the most patrons possible. So if you would like to become a patron of the New Prague Area Historical Society, you can stop up at the table here afterwards. We'd love to have you as a member of our group. So at this time, I will hand this, uh, the microphone over to Sue. We are trying out a new sound system tonight, so if you can't quite hear, just you know, give a thumbs up to us and we can turn up the volume for you guys. So, all right, and further ado, here is Sue. Hi, everybody. First off, I need my two volunteers. And Terry is, is also volunteering. She's been my van up before, so. Okay. Um, I do this presentation for Quilt Guild um, from time to time, so I've done it a few times, but I've never done more of the history of quilting. Um, the Historical Society gave me 30 to 45 minutes. I may go long. I have 5,400 years of quilting history to cover. <laughs> Evidence of quilts is on a wall in an Egyptian tomb that dates back to 3400 BC. It happens to be a log cabin block. We'll show you what block that is for those of you that don't know um, later. Um, if any of you have seen the articles, the TV shows on the terracotta army that was found in China, their clothing is quilted. It was part of their Huh? So apparently it just had to work. Um, the Turks and the Crusaders also wore them under their armor um, as protection and as war. So quilting goes back a long ways, though it was in the early years clothing, not necessarily what we think of today as a quilt. The oldest blocks are, and I'll show you examples of these um, later, as the Crazy Quilt, the Rose of Sharon, the Moy Star, a Nine Patch, a Pinwheel, the Log Cabin, and the Dresden Plate. Um, there were very few quilted patterns, excuse me, um, prior to 1850. And so most of quilting was handed down from um, mother to daughter, to daughter through family or through friends when they got together for quilting bees. Um, they were a necessity in order to get the quilting done, but they were also the learning time for the younger ones to learn the craft. Patterns um, were also used and the young women would make sampler quilts um, we'll have a few of those later also, and that's when we'll show you more of the blocks. Um, it gets a little confusing, and I'm sorry, but adding history to my history uh, doesn't quite work. Um, in the late 1850s, the Ladies Art Company formed, and they had a catalog where you could order patterns, pre-cut quilts, finished blocks, finished quilts, all through the catalog. Patterns also became printed in magazines and newspapers in the 1920s. One of those was the Kansas City Star. Um, blocks were printed weekly in that newspaper from September of 1928 through July 
1938, and then printed, printed sporadically until 1961. They printed 1,068 patterns in all. Um, quilt kits also came, became popular in the 1930s through the 1970s. They were where you could order an entire kit, pre-cut, and detailed instructions. A lot of them were applique, and the um, outline of where each piece was supposed to be applique was printed on the background. Um. Lost interest in World War II because there were other things that were going on. Um, a lot of women that sewed their um, effort went to bandages. Um, there were the Peace Gardens, um, the Victory Gardens. And then quilting saw a revival in the late 60s and 70s. And part of that had to do with um, competition based around the bicentennial of the U.S. and also the centennial of the Statue of Liberty. One of our friends, um, her mother is actually one of the Liberty Ladies, which were the state winners for um, the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. So Kat's mother is Liberty Lady from the state of Wyoming. She toured the, the uh, world teaching classes because of that. So um, entering competitions can become quite involved. The 1970s also saw the small brick and mortar quilt shops. And they have gotten more popular and then waned and gotten more popular. And now there are more of them closing with um, online sales. And it's become a more difficult industry. But there are still new ones opening all the time, so. My, qu my quilting history goes back 55 years. I, it keeps fading in and out, I'm wondering why. back 55 years with quilting. I made my first quilt when I was nine years old. I started sewing when I was four. Yeah, it, it, it's going in and out. So ladies, you can take the cover off the bed. The first quilt is my first quilt. It hangs in my quilt shop. Um, I Worked at Quilting by the Hearth in Lonsdale for 10 years and was told to my face on more than one occasion that my quilts were intimidating. So when I opened my own shop, it was very important that my first quilt hung in my shop um, because I started the same place everybody else has just a lot longer ago. So this is my first quilt. It's actually um, patches that were um, hand basted under and then zigzagged to an old sheet. The back of it is squares, and if you take a look at it, you will see that my corners don't match whatsoever in some places. But I was nine. I, this is known basically as a crazy quilt. I am a fourth generation quilter. I learned everything I know either by teaching myself, you can drop it on, the, on top of the, um, teaching myself or what I learned from my mother and my grandmother. Um, this next wall hanging is a wall hanging that I designed. My mother did the hand applique, yeah, and I did the hand quilting. Um, I grew up learning how to hand quilt. Um, if any of you knew my mother, you know that she was quite the quilter. Um, she actually told me while I was doing this that my hand quilting um, surpassed hers. So, um, quite an honor for me. So, there are different types of quilting, different types of quilt. This is a Bargello, so they look much more complicated than they are. Um, it's all done with strip sets. 
And this one is designed to look like a mountain scene. All right, I gotta take this off. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned the log cabin block and that it was found in, in writings in ancient Egypt. This is a log cabin. There are over 150 different layouts for the log cabin block. Um, logs varied in size. Uh, this one, they finish at half an inch. Some year it will get quilted. It's been done at the top for a long time, um, but other ones have taken precedence. Now we talked about crazy quilts. <laughs> this is truly a crazy quilt, as opposed to my first one. Um, this is actually 10 hand techniques by three generations of my family. So me, my mother, and her mother. Um, a traditional crazy quilt would have had embroidery over all of the seams. I do not like embroidery that much. And I had plenty of lace, so I used lace over most of my seams instead of embroidery. Um, this hangs in my shop. If you want a closer look at it, you can always come and see it. Yeah, I'm done. I had a gentleman come to the shop and wanted to buy this next quilt till he looked at the label and figured out it wasn't in it. Well, this is the best name, best name pattern ever. It's called, oh my gosh. And that's everybody's reaction to the quilt. Once again, it's in my shop all the time. And um, two years ago, I bought 10 of the patterns because I could finally find a source for the patterns because the designer died about 10 years ago. I bought 10 patterns thinking there's not that many crazy people in the world. I sold 12 of them in a week. In less than two and a half years, I have sold 75 patterns for this particular quilt at the shop. So, um, go for it. So, what it is, is two fly block that has, um, miniature four patches in a square and a square. And that alternates with a um, triple nine patch, double nine patch, double nine patch, where the five of the blocks in the nine patch are nine patches made out of half inch finished squares. And he, huh? No, it is all cut individually. You could do it in a strip set if you wanted to. And I've also had people say, well, that took up a lot of your scraps. It's like, no. <laughs> so another type of quilting is foundation paper piecing. Now, I learned this technique when I was young, but it wasn't on paper. My grandmother, her mother, any of buddy from that generation would have, design, would have drawn the design onto muslin and then sewn their pieces onto muslin as a foundation. Everybody thinks that foundation and paper piecing is something new. It's not. We've just started using paper and we take the paper out. They've also gone full circle now, and you can buy pre-printed pre blocks to sew onto stabilizer and leave the stabilizer in. So we've gone full circle. And I've gone, I've gone from cardboard templates made from cereal boxes that you traced around, and then you cut it out with the scissors, to now we have rotary cutters and plexiglass rulers and templates. Also, we have more different ways of making half square triangles or flying geese, which are two different makeup blocks of a lot of blocks. We used to cut every triangle and then have to sew all the triangles together. 
So this is foundation piecing. This is a pattern that I designed to teach beginning paper piecing when I worked at the quilt shop in Lonsdale. I always said I would never paper piece. Keep that in mind as we go through this. Don't ever say never. So this is, I'm gonna take that from you, Terry, and you can just set the piece of paper down. No. <laughs> yeah. So this is what the pattern makes. This is a queen size quilt. I've learned a few things teaching classes. People are intimidated to cut up their good fabric and, and try a technique that they don't know. So when I first started teaching this class, I would get every, give everybody a piece of paper and enough of my scraps to make their first block. So that's how this quilt began. Of course, I had to do quite a few blocks, but the start of it was my students. Okay, so we had the best name pattern ever. This next one is the worst name pattern ever. This quilt is called Nearly Insane. <laughs> it should be called Completely Insane. The original quilt was made in 1870 on the East Coast. So keep in mind, no decent light, no electricity, no modern sewing machine, no modern method of cutting, no printed patterns necessarily, though by that point there may have been. Yeah. Everyone is different. And um, when you put a block on point, you have, <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, it's the other one. Um, when you put a block on point, you have um, filler blocks at the edges. Those are actually, those, the, the filler blocks on this one are actually partial blocks. They are not just a piece of um, fabric that was put in as that setting triangle. I fell in love with this quilt on the way, on the way home from the second time I went to Paducah for quilt week. We stopped at the Amish show on sale in Kelowna, Iowa. I saw this quilt with the price tag of $10,000 on it. Figured I would never ever find the pattern. Went to the Minnesota Guild show in Duluth the next summer. I found the book. Um, Lois Lewis was allowed to go into the historical um, society and actually work with the original quilt. And so what you get in the book is a six inch to the scale drawing. No other instructions. So sampler, block, sampler quilts would have been used to teach and pass on the various blocks. So I have three sampler quilts. I did all three of them within 15 months. This is the farmer's wife. <laughs> yes, Harry. Um, this is the farmer's wife. And um, the farm journal asked their, the wives of their farmers to write in letters. Um, describing their life as a, as a farmer's wife. And so the author of the book then took those letters and found blocks that fit the letters, and that became the quilt. <laughs> of course they are, they would need to keep you warm. This. Sylvia's Bridal Sampler. It's a Mary Shiverini um, pattern that goes with her novel. And it was, the book is about um, Sylvia and the community coming together and each one her wedding quilt. Um, the post-it notes on them are to show you some of those, some of those first original blocks. So the one that's up there, nope, below it, the white one, you had it for it right first. That's a friendship star. Down, the blue one, the light blue and white one by your, nope, right by you. That's a nine patch. <laughs> the 
The one below the post-it note <laughs> is a Dresden plate. Yep, you have to lift it up higher. Yep. The pink and blue one there, that is a Lemoy star. And if you never made a Lemoy star, make it the easy way and do half square triangles. Don't do the diamonds because it's a real pain to do all those Y seams. I couldn't see at this angle which one it was, but um, the black and dark blue one, the real dark one, um, is a pinwheel. So I have most of those all, all blocks in this quilt, so that's why this quilt had to come out. It normally doesn't make my show. Yes, each block is quilted differently. Um, I do own a long arm. It hasn't, owned, it hasn't run since I opened the quilt shop. But I bought the one that I did because I could do the old traditional hand quilting motifs and do stuff that was more block specific. Then I got into paper piecing. This is Wheel of Fortune. It is a Jacqueline Dijon pattern, and um, it only has 10 fabrics in it. So it stays in the shop and it gets used as an example of how to use ombres, which is a fabric that changes color from one side to the other of the fabric. So there's the two backgrounds, there's, there's eight different ombres to get the different shades of color. Um, my friend Kat did the long arm quilting. Um, it has shown in competition. We together as a team um, compete at national show, ranked shows. Um, it did not ribbon at all. Not at all. This is Carol Doak's 50 Fabulous Star Blocks. There's one for each state of the U.S. So there's 49 on the front. The 50th one, the quarter of it, is my label. And I told you I don't like hand embroidering. I hand embroider all of my labels. But the quilt showed at... And at the bottom. Quilt showed at various... Um, county fairs. Kat and I, a few years, took it upon ourselves and a bunch of us from New Prague to try and get competition participation up at the county fairs because there are fairs that you can enter no matter what county you live in. So Kat took care of all of that. It actually, sh it, it also showed at the North Dakota State Show. Um, and one best use of batiks. We're almost done. <laughs> Kat and I sent, sent two, quilts, two quilts to the um, quilt show in Madison, Wisconsin in September. Um, they do Facebook reels on about five of the quilts that were in the show. This was one of them that they did a reel on. Um, so you can go on the Great Wisconsin quilt show and see the reel. But um, Kat used eight or nine different. Can I get rid of this? If you want, yeah, it's fine. Here, do you want me to?
ribbon at the Minnesota Quilt Guild show in St. Cloud in June of last year. I actually got a red ribbon, so second place. Um, the lady that won first place against me has won the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show and other AQS shows, best in show on more than one occasion. So I lost to good company. <laughs> this is, has never been a goal of mine. It's something that because Kat and I just managed to team up and we work so well together, um, that's become um, part of our quilting life. Kat is also a fourth generation quilter. And this is our pride and joy. It still is going to one more quilt show. Um, the name of the quilt is Misty Morning. It belongs to Kat when it's done with its show life because I cannot pay her to do our competition quilt. So it has to be a collaborative effort. So she calls it Cowboys and Indians. There are 1,736 swords pieces quilts on the quilt. They are each um, placed with the tweezers and then heated up because they have a heat sensitive glue on the back of them, which what, with what looks like a soldering iron. There's no way I would get a, anything that hot next to my quilt, let alone somebody else's or one that's poor competition. Um,
than to listen with your eyes. And another question, if I were to look for a quilt time-wise appropriate for the long house and the rope bed, which is not anywhere near the size of these, what pattern do you think I might be wise in pursuing? What year are we talking about? 1870. Um, German family. Bob Haddon, Dresden Flake. the best way to take care of your quilts? Refold them every so often. Okay. Use them. Um, quilts are made to be used in most cases. Um, show quilts do not do well on the bed. Because if you look at the, the one that she carried around, um, when Kat brought it to me after she had quilted it, she told me she was bringing back my piece of cardboard. Because when you put that much quilting into the quilt, it gets stick. And so it doesn't stay on the bed. But quilts are made to be used. They are not normal laundry. They should not get thrown into the rest of your dirty laundry. They should only be washed if they are soiled. If they just need to be refreshed, you hang them outside somewhere or put them in the dryer on airflow. They are not to be washed at a um, continual basis. Most quilts don't get worn out, they get washed to death. Mm -hmm. If you're going to store it, store it in a coat. Yes, not plastic. It should be 100% cotton pillowcases. Anybody else? Yes? How long do some of those show quilts take me? <laughs> Prior to me only having a quilt top, I could make a, a top like that at about a month and a half, two months. After owning the quilt top, six months, nine months. That's your part. That's my part. That's not how long it takes to quilt. Um, Misty Morning, Kat had on her long arm for one month, 30 days. long arm. Is that the machine that was in your store that's like this long? Is that what that? Or I, I don't, don't have a long arm in, I don't know what in a my long store. store. Oh, I don't know um, what a long arm is. Montgomery does, but Gary? It's a sewing machine that the sewing machine moves across a table that holds your fabric, holds the quilt, and the quilt is on rollers so you can do like a whole section. On my machine I can do about a foot at a time
type of clothing where I learn how to do it. And then the Minnesota Quilt Guild um, years ago, and thank you, Dennis, um, started cataloging all of the quilts in Minnesota that they put. So some of the historical quilts in Minnesota are in here. They went to different areas of, of the state. Surprisingly, none of my mothers are in here. So I had heard of the, the organization that was doing it. Um, but I want to, I want to say, tell them something funny about this quote. Um, years ago, our Quilt group in town did a living estate sale for um, one of our family members that has since passed. And we sold her kits, her material, and her books and patterns. So I opened the book right after Dennis left. And that is the Stanton Years T Shaper from Montgomery. That's Cat. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it at the book sale at the library. <laughs>
actual two state sales. Um, I know I have friends that do and do rescue them. A lot of times they are tops that have never been finished. And luckily I have friends that do hand quilt and they um, hand quilt them. Um, I don't know, Terry, if you've had anybody bring you an old quilt pot, I know Chad has gotten a few um, grandmother's flower gardens that were old and hand pieced that she quilted. Um, the thing is to finish them properly is nice. Unfortunately, one of the things that's been happening lately is people buy an old quilt and they cut it out and they make a jacket <laughs> or a pillow. It's not that they're just trying to salvage what's good about it. They think it's perfectly good and in some cases not knowing historical quilt and just cutting it out, which is a shame. Unfortunately, our mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers did not put labels on their quilts, except for crazy quilts, or um, friendship quilts where they would have put their name and the date. Um, Dennis brought me a crazy quilt that was donated to the Historic Society a while ago now, and he did the genealogy work on it, but one of the blocks was signed by the lady that had made it, and it said how old she was and what date it was that she had finished it. And she would have been born in 1816. So, um, but we found out it had no tie to, to a new brain. And it was never a finished quilt. But crazy quilts are made out of, in most cases, wool, satin, velvet, um, materials that do not do well with water. This quilt had been stored in an attic, it had gotten wet, and the um, acid, the chemicals in the, in the water had reacted with the silk. So anything that was silk on that um, quilt was brittle and decayed. The kind of clovers often look for silk tie, and silk tie. I'm going to just give this real quick. I'd just like to say thank you to Sue. We appreciate you so much for coming out and taking all this time and energy to bring your quilts out and share the history and just um, everything that you've done. It's really amazing. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We appreciate you being here and supporting the New Prague Area Historical Society. Have a good night, everyone.